Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to answer subscribers' question. Hey Dimitri, thanks for your videos. They've been super helpful in my journey. I had a question, if you don't mind, how does model validation differ on machine learning models? It would appear to be more involved, but I've seen many solutions like Data Robot provide tools to assist in validation that seems to make it easier. This comment is on the video of model validation detailed process. So I would highly recommend before you jump onto the comments here and bandwagoning people, uh, please, please, please go above and click the link or go below uh, to the link of the other video so you can understand the full process here. Um, but the general process is going to be data, so data processing, data cleaning, set, selecting data sets, development, and out of time. Yes, out of time is a mandatory requirement. Uh, when you do a course machine learning, you will have development validation and out of time and then you will go through the model selection process. Uh, you will go on to performance review and testing, and you'll have your final stages of like model governance and documentation and all that. Uh, the process between machine learning and statistical models and mathematical models and any sort of model in general is the exact same. Now, I know people in the industry have been all up in arms. This is somewhat controversial. I've seen banks like panicking and then they go, oh, we're gonna redefine what a model is. And when you get down to it, um, machine learning models and statistical models are really nothing but the same thing. Um, even many of them get cross-classified. So logistic regression, people, oh, it's machine learning. Um, no, it's statistical modeling. And machine learning is the same thing as statistical modeling. It's all kind of one framework here. Um, so how do we actually go through and validate them? Give you a little bit of insight because I've failed a ton of machine learning models uh, in a short stint of probably three, four years of uh, reviewing those sorts of models uh, tied into one of the firms I was at, one of the large banks. To start off with here, people that build machine learning models typically build garbage models. So they're extremely easy to beat and to fail as a model validator. Um, let's give an example here. Uh, Random Forest, XGBoost, um, LightGBM, these sorts of models, all tree-based models here. I'll put a link to those as well. Um, I have another video talking about number spaces, probability spaces. Um, decision trees are absolute garbage when it comes to regression. Yes, even with like the new hypey thing of people like, ooh, but what if instead of an average or a median, you put a linear line, like a linear regression in each leaf? That doesn't solve the issue. Uh, it still does not predict well outside of the number space um, that they're being predicted in. Now, that sort of number space measure theory, looking at probabilities and you know that sort of thing here, these are the sort of things a validation team should do, but you cannot do this unless you fully understand probability, uh, number spaces, measure theory, things that banks don't typically like to look at. Why? Because most of your quants probably have not taken these courses, um, or it's been very long ago they've taken these, but these are the sort of things that impact both statistical models, which we have gotten way too comfortable with, um, which is why my fail rate, I proudly put it out there, is two thirds of every model that comes across my desk in the professional space and the big banks, I failed. Um, and that's even with pushback and political nonsense and dealing with managers and all that. So two thirds of the models failed because they're not done correctly. Uh, most of those statistics models, many of the machine learning models. But you need to dig deeper on how a decision tree is fit or how a neural network is structured, designed, and fit. Um, I will throw out there too, Wells Fargo. So shout out to a goose. I'll put a link maybe above or below to that as well. Um, a goose, Sunjianto, just retired from Wells Fargo, was the head of model validation or model risk management uh, over there. He has had a huge hand in what's called PyML. So P I and then ML. Uh, it's a package inside of Python. So you're probably gonna be building your machine learning packages in Python. Uh, PyML does a lot of that. Uh, there's even an interview that was I like, mentioned, which I'll link, is us discussing uh, using neural networks. So long ago, he had his PhD, uh, worked in neural networks. Um, and he's talking about you can just do linear approximations um, to a neural network. So you can actually break this down and put this into a linear model framework. You can do a lot more simple statistical testing. Uh, the PyML package though, uh, he'd been working with a lot with a few other individuals at all or firms that put all this together um, for doing validations. I have not used the PyML, but given my discussions with him uh, on machine learning and how to validate and the strengths and weaknesses um, of many of the other metrics, for example, like Lyme and Shapley have a bunch of issues that they're not theoretically sound on how they're being used by many people. There might be cases for how they can be used and should be used. We look at them. So I'll tell you personally, we look at them internally. Uh, we use them as some sort of gauge, um, but we put a lot more emphasis and stress on things like 
the number space because the model is only going to operate in very specific parameters and conditions. Um, and risk management, which is the entire purpose of model validation, is to kind of state those issues, state those risks. Now, the easiest way to fail these, as I was kind of mentioning before, just build a simple version of the model, same variable, same model type, and just cut them way back so they're super small. And every single time I've done that, I can hands down just beat these models. And what do I mean by this? So let's go through an example here. Uh, there was a, I think a loan default model, so like a probability of default model uh, that was being built at one of the firms I was at. Uh, it was a random forest model, I believe, and they did a, a GBM, XGBM, so gradient boosting decision tree sort of model. Um, the gradient boosting decision tree is the easiest example to use. They built this massive tree uh, and they had thousands of leaves. Uh, one, First off, validation finding a red flag. Uh, there's only like 10 to 15 observations in each leaf, okay? That's not valid. That's not even a valid sample. Imagine taking 10 points, 15 points of data and taking an average and saying that average is representative of something. It's not. Um, so that's the one red flag. Now you can argue, so if you're smarter and you put a little effort in this, uh, as a developer, you could argue that while the decision tree in itself has filtered out um, through the splits and the residual splits after that to the gradient boosting, um, that we ended up getting to some sort of population that was fairly stable and reliable. And this is just a very simple estimation of that pre-filtered space here. Now you could say that, uh, but I wouldn't buy it as a validator because even then you probably still have over split, right? Why do you only have 10 to 15, even 30, for example, uh, data points in a very small space? It's not going to hold in finance. Finance is moving. It is moving and dynamic. It is not the real physical world or things are like physics and chemistry and they come out to the same answer. Um, so that is the first red flag. Now, the second red flag with this besides the number of leaves is going to be the size of the tree. So you put the same variables in as a validator, you do the same model type, for example, like XGBoost, and you make the tree quite small. So instead of having, I don't know, 20, 50, 100, 200 layers, I mean, I've seen absurd numbers. You have these massive trees. If you scale them down and then you go through and you do development and out of time testing, and you, you can look at the validation if you want. I don't really care about that, but you look at the development, which is going to be way overfit, obviously. Uh, but if you build it correctly and you try not to overfit it and you use different ways of doing that, you can build out your development sample in your out of time sample uh, and you can look at the two and see. So what ends up happening, let's say we're looking at AUC as a metric, uh, you built out a decision tree, your development AUC is 0.78, your out of time is 0.79. Uh, if I build a tree, instead of it being say a thousand leaves and I build it out and it has 32 leaves and my tree now has like a 0.75 and a 0.74 for out of time, I'm gonna push you until you have to use the small tree. You cannot use the big one, right? The amount of complexity that is in a huge tree with a thousand leaves is far more risky, far more likely to break and is almost guaranteed to be overfit at that point. Whereas when you start to look at a tree that is much, much smaller with the same variables set for selection, uh, the same model type right now, we're starting to get to apples to apples, you cannot do that. So I tend to fail those models and say, look, here's an alternative. We basically beat yours, it's twice as simple. It only performs slightly worse on fit. Um, it is much closer to industry standard as well, between 0.7 and 0.8 for AUC. 0.8 and above is typically overfit, but between 0.7 and 0.8 for AUC, model performs well. That's gonna be an easy win right there. Um, now the third red flag for any of these and why I fail so many of these is because typically those fitting machine learning models don't fully comprehend the difference between out of sample and out of time. Okay, so this has to do with your, your we're gonna call it your testing data in the machine learning space. You cannot randomly sample across a time frame. Let's say you take um, data from, I don't know, say 2018 through 2024, and you randomly sample 30% for your testing or your out of sample data, and then the other 70% is going to be your development data and your validation data, which you can split out here in a second. You can't do that. That is not how finance works. It's a financial feature that's built into financial markets. Financial markets move quickly. They're very, very dynamic. Um, when you do this, what ends up happening is your development and your out of time samples and your validation sample will be over the same time range. Because you do this, what ends up happening is you're seeing the same patterns and the same trends, especially in the credit space. Because we have millions of observations, you're almost sampling the same pool three different times. So all three data sets are going to look 
the exact same. When you go to build a model, it's going to look very stable and robust. The issue is when you go to implement that, right? Now in 2024 and 2025, when you're using the model, guess what? The market in 2024 and 2025 looks nothing like the market in 22, 23, uh, 2018. Like when you start going back in time, the market's completely different. Now people are gonna say, well, of course it's different. Yeah, that's why you can't use a model like that. It is not robust enough to handle the real world changes in time. Um, that is probably the other common red flag I see and the reason I fail uh, so many machine learning models with that. So anyways, validation process for these should be the exact same, right? Uh, the tests that you would actually do on them will be different. So my team has an internal proprietary metric for determining overfit, underfit, um, and a few other pieces here with decision tree-based models here. So LightGBM, XGBoost, Random Forest, and all that. Um, we have metrics that we actually use that are tests. They're things I have created internally. I have not publicly released. I need to write papers on them. It's a whole process. I don't have time. Um, but that's something that we use internally. But every sort of model has different tests, right? When you start to look at, um, for example, a time series model, or you look at like a logistic regression, or you look at OLS, or you look at weighted least squares, Right, you're going to be running different sorts of statistical tests based on your data type. So if you're using panel data or time series or cross-sectional, you'll use different tests. Machine learning is no different. It is a different type of model that might have a specific type of data set and you should be running some sort of statistical tests on those. Um, again, validation process is the same. Data, uh, variable selection process, model fitting process, uh, performance review and residual analysis at the end here. All sort of the same thing here. But this has become quite a controversial, I think, for many firms because banks want like a, and validators and regulators and everybody, they want like a handbook handed to them. Like, Dimitri, tell me the five tests that go with this model type, which perhaps maybe I could one day put those together for you guys. But uh, right now, no, that does not exist. You have to have qualified quantity quantitative model developers and quantitative validators that are actually going to be able to look at the number spaces. They're going to look at the residuals, be able to do a full residual analysis and tell you there is a biases or there's over or underfitting within there. Um, be able to catch, for example, the out of sample versus out of time and why that's invalid and broken. Um, and then going into other tools like PyML and looking at um, can you do a linear approximation to the same function that's a neural network, for example? You can then interpret that because we have linear regression to do that. You can use packages like PyML. Um, they mentioned too in their data robot. <sighs> please don't use DataRobot. Um, I have used them professionally. They're really nice people. Um, they're trying to create really cool things, um, but I wouldn't trust what comes out of DataRobot for model validations, especially at a bank with regulators where you actually have to be correct and right. Uh, DataRobot tries to do a lot of things automated, which is great. It's trying to make it easy and process. Uh, the results you get out, the assumptions that go into their tests, into their analysis, um, are often not very good decisions. If you were a statistician or a mathematician or a quant looking at these, you would be like, why the hell would it be done this way? Um, again, wouldn't depend on it. I also would not depend though, as I mentioned, purely on Shapley values or Lime. Um, yes, they're good tools to get some insight, to get some feature importance. Again, none of these are even valid if you don't understand your number space that you started with here. I'm hitting this really hard because I don't see a lot of people talking about number spaces. And this impacts not just machine learning, but also statistics. And I don't see it even talked about that much on the statistics and the math side as well. So anyways, validation process is the same. It is controversial because there's not a nice, easy, simple solution and answer, especially when firms are getting like really good accuracy numbers and they're building these massively over complex models. Um, in practice, they will fill, fail. They will not work. Many of the banks that actually are using machine learning models are doing it successfully. Um, for example, many banks use fraud models. So when we build fraud models, we're using machine learning based. They work absolutely amazing. We are using a lot of them right now. We are using uh, machine learning models internally here at the firm I'm at currently. We do it safely. We monitor things. Uh, we do a bunch of tests, as I mentioned. You have to get a little creative, look in the data, look at the modeling structures and figure all that out yourself. Um, but it should go through that same kind of validation process here. And I am sorry, guys, it is not going to be an easy, like check the box thing. Uh, even with stats models, as I mentioned, I failed two thirds of every model that came across my desk as a validator. And that is so only because most people just don't know what they're doing um, and they can't see where the mistakes are being made because they haven't dug deep enough into the math behind these sorts of models. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.